a teacher, an activist, an actor, and the state senator elect for New York's 25th State Senate District. Javari attended both New York University's Tisch School of the Arts and Yale School of Drama. Javari's campaign ran on a strong platform focusing on fair elections, strong COVID-19 response, progressive climate and energy policies, criminal justice reform, immigration reform, and of course, animal rights. As Senator-elect Brisport was endorsed by Food and Water Watch, Professor Naomi Klein, US Senator Bernie Sanders, Congress member Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and many more. We also have Delciana Winders, or Delcy, who is a clinical professor of law at Lewis and Clark Law School, where she directs the Animal Law Litigation Clinic. Prior to joining Lewis and Clark faculty, Delcy was vice president and deputy general counsel for the PETA Foundation and the first academic fellow of the Harvard Animal Law and Policy Program and a visiting scholar at the Elizabeth Howe School of Law at Pace University in New York. Uh, Delcy received her BA in legal studies with highest honors from the University of California at Santa Cruz and her JD from NYU School of Law. Then we have Scott Weathers, who leads the Good Food Institute state level lobbying efforts, working to level the playing field for cultivated and plant-based meat, dairy, and eggs. He came to GFI from Compassion World Farming USA, where he was a strategic partnerships manager, establishing Compassion's first ever program focused on plant-based proteins. Scott's work has appeared in the New York Times, Guardian, Vox, and he holds a master's of science from the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. Last but definitely not least, we have Lewis Spollard, who leads a world-renowned grant-making organization, Open Philanthropy's strategy for farm animal welfare. Uh, prior to joining Open Phil, Lewis worked as a policy advisor and international liaison to the CEO at the Humane Society for the United States, HSUS. And prior to that, he was a litigation fellow at HSUS, a law student and an associate consultant at Bain and Company. Um, Lewis has a BA from Harvard University in Social Studies and a JD from Yale Law School. So pretty impressive panel, I think you'll all agree. Really, really happy to have you all here. Um, it's going to be a pretty kind of informal um, panel discussion to start and then we can move to audience Q&A. But to start off, I kind of wanted to start very generally speaking, um, maybe asking this to you, Nancy, uh, what your main kind of takeaways are for the election, like where you think animals did well, where did they did not so well, and where maybe advocates should be looking? Well, uh, these are great questions to be asking right now, and I'm honored to be asked to join you all to share thoughts on this. Um, we are still digesting these results. Some of these results are still coming in, as you all know, um, but I want to start just by framing how we think about these elections. Um, from a national animal protection standpoint, we really strive to remain bipartisan in all of our work. And so as we're looking at elections, you know, we all have our own convictions and our own values. And certainly there are differences between the parties on these issues, but it is very important to try to find ways to build bridges between the parties wherever possible so that our really important set of issues don't become captured by any particular party. And that's why we always try with all of our legislation to ensure that we have leadership on both sides of the aisle. Um, it just feels very important to remain wherever possible positioned in that way. There are times when that is not possible on some of the issues we work on, but, um, but we try to think of it that way. So today I think we'll be talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly of these results as it relates to animals specifically and not one party or another. Um, there's an awful lot of focus on the presidency and the race that um, leads to the White House. And that's certainly been a very dramatic situation. And I think it can be a little too diverting for us and we may not spend enough time thinking about well, what's happening federally in the other chambers, and also um, thinking about the state level elections. I'm so glad we have a state uh, official with us today. So excited to meet Jabari and, and um, welcome his interaction in the New York um, level leadership. I'm sure he will be. Uh, so that's very exciting and um, a real honor for us today. Those races are as important, if not more important, 
uh, because those local level opportunities are really significant for farm animals and all animals. And then even thinking about more local levels um, at the city level. And a reminder that these elections um, that happen every four years, uh, we highlight the presidential race, but every two years, all of the House of Representatives is up for election. That doesn't mean it's a total turnover every two years, but we do see changes every two years. And those are really important in terms of opportunities for animals. Also, a third of the Senate every two years turns over. So, or at least has the opportunity to turn over. So I think it's really important to pay attention to what's happening there. Most states have elections every few years, but it really depends on the state. Every state is so different. So um, we've been trying to metabolize all of that. Um, one last sort of general point I wanna make before we talk about the details here um, is that we need to be thinking of today and this moment in time as a starting point, not an end point. Because as we look at these elections, it's too late to affect outcomes, right? For the most part, I know there's still an outstanding question in Georgia, um, but as far as influencing things, you know, we, we're, we're at the end of the process, not the beginning. And I hope that it will give us real motivation as we look at these results to think about how we're gonna plant seeds going forward. Identifying candidates um, like Jabari, like people who are really invested in driving these issues forward, because that's going to make the biggest difference of all. But here we are, we've seen the results. Um, what are they? What do they look like? Um, at the federal level, clearly, you know, again, all this focus has been on the White House. And I, I do think that we will have much greater opportunity under a Biden-Harris administration. That is certainly what we are preparing for. Um, and I do think that, you know, the, the fact that both of these individuals, the president-elect and the vice president-elect, have invested themselves personally in specific animal protection issues is an incredibly important sign. They, they understand the import of these issues. Um, Mr. Biden has been over and over throughout many years now, many decades, has been a reliable supporter and even a leader on some issues. He's really spearheaded efforts to finally end horse slaughter in the United States and export for slaughter for human consumption. So that is, that is an important um, note for us. Um, Ms. Harris has been a leader on protecting dog fighting victims. She actually leads a piece of legislation in the Senate that would address their needs. So that is, that is a real sign of sensitivity, but being at the top in the White House or you know, in the vice presidency really removes you from the day-to-day -day operation of how these issues are implemented on the ground. So I'm very encouraged by that race turning out the way that it has, but we have yet to see how that power will be exercised. And a lot of how that's gonna be exercised will be in which, the, which cabinet picks we get. Who's gonna lead up these really critical federal agencies and commissions? And um, both the main cabinet picks and then the, the lower level appointees going down. Those people wield so much power. And you're going to hear about that from other panelists, so I'm not going to belabor this point. But I do think that's one of the things that we're really watching right now. Um, and I'll mention a few um, folks as we, in, in just a moment, I'm going to finish talking about some of the other federal and state results. Obviously, um, there was a lot of hope and expectation that there would be greater swings left in the House and in the Senate. That did not occur. This was actually a very fruitful election for Republicans overall. Um, in fact, some Republicans that I have talked to and work with indicate that they're very pleased because they feel the party's been purged of Trumpism um, in an official sense, not quite yet, but they are encouraged by that opportunity to remake the party. And they've had gains in both the House and it appears in the Senate they've held on to what was uh, a hoped for flip in leadership. And those leadership issues aren't just you know, for territory or ego, they're really critical in terms of decision-making. The way legislation works is the chair of a committee has absolute authority in determining whether or not a bill is gonna be heard and whether or not there's gonna be a vote on a bill. So if the Senate 
does have a flip and there is still that outstanding chance with these two Senate races in Georgia. That would be very significant in terms of shifting to a Schumer leadership in the Senate and what that would look like. And Mr. Schumer has been extremely supportive of our priority issues uh, for animals. So we'll have to all watch and see what happens there. There were no other heavily significant changes in the House or Senate races in terms of losing or gaining leaders, except I would say um, there was a real surprise and that was the um, ouster of uh, Colin Peterson, a Minnesota Democrat who um, has traditionally been really rurally minded and he has been a block on almost all animal welfare uh, legislation coming through the Agriculture Committee. So he is no longer in the House come January and someone else will take over that committee. We are gonna be watching closely who that will be. The next two folks in line, um, uh, Scott and uh, Costa, are both um, very different. Uh, Mr. Scott has been mixed in his support, but has real potential um, because he's very focused on um, uh, the WIC program and uh, other more traditionally liberally minded, more urban minded um, programs that should be helpful for our agenda in the Ag Committee. Uh, Mr. Costa has proven himself not to be interested in animal welfare over the, over the years. So that would be a, a shift in the other direction. So these are really important nuances. Um, and then I'll just, I've spoken way too long here. So I'm gonna pull back and just say that um, there were several key states where there was some hope for bigger shifts left, um, New York, and North Carolina and Florida, and that did not really happen. So um, that also indicates that this country is still very much in the middle politically, and we won't see massive change. One note is they no longer have a veto-proof majority for Republicans in North Carolina. This is very significant because the ag-gag efforts, uh, if you're familiar with ag-gag legislation, and some of our other panelists may wanna cover it, um, that, that was a real struggle in North Carolina because of the massive majority Republicans had. They were able to get a very, um, un, very harmful ag-gag bill through. And it's possible we could make progress again in North Carolina with some of the shifts that we've seen. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pull back for now because I feel like I've talked for too long, but there are some exciting um, cabinet um, picks that we should talk about as we have this conversation. And I'm gonna step back and let others bring that up and I'll certainly weigh in if needed. Thank you so much, Nancy, for that really comprehensive and quite nuanced kind of uh, overview. I'm interested maybe next in, uh, in Jabari, in um, Senator-elect uh, Brisport's um, take, you know, from where you are, are sitting as a candidate and now uh, elected official, you know, what are your kind of high level um, general takes on the election, and then perhaps we'll move on to those cabinet picks after. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just also want to just say thank you for organizing this, Becky and Rocky, thank you for inviting me and Nancy, thank you for your expertise. I, you know, that was very interesting for me to hear and I learned some things about, you know, for animals at the federal level, which was uh, exciting for me. Um, so at the state level, you know, it, a lot of results for um, Republicans mirrored what Nancy was talking about a lot across the country, even in, in New York State, you know, a lot of us were really hoping for um, a huge surge in turnout that would guarantee a, a Democratic supermajority in the uh, state Senate, which would allow us to override the governor's uh, veto and, you know, and ensure like a lot more progressive legislation. Um, that's looking very unlikely. It may, be, may even be that we actually um, have a few sewer, uh, fewer seats than we had last term for Democrats. Um, I don't think we'll lose our majority, um, but, it, you know, we may not get that supermajority, uh, which means, you know, it won't be as of an um, easy battle, it'll be more of an uphill battle than we were expecting for progressive legislation that includes for things um, for the animals, but um, definitely not undoable. Uh, we're just, you know, we're waiting, you know, for the final counts and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a margin, I think it's like six or eight um, state legislators who are still just waiting to see if it's going to be the Democrat or the Republican that pulls ahead once all the mail-in votes are counted. But um, I think, you know, regardless of the fact um, aside from just, you know, who gets elected, because, you know, these things are about movements and people on the ground as well. Um, we do have a much larger awakening of people that are interested in animal activism, 
Um, it, it's it's funny. I also get asked like how being a vegan or running as a vegan, open vegan um, impacted the campaign. And I was like, there, there was zero negatives. Like you know, people were excited by it. Um, people uh, were wanting to phone bank or volunteer on the campaign because of it. And um, people, I got multiple messages from people saying they were impressed at seeing a, a platform that had animal rights on it because um, that's not really a thing that uh, people often do. So uh, I think that is a great, um, you know, regardless of you know, how many seats we end up with, like we have a much larger swell of activism. Um, and um, I think we're talking more about state latest, latest stuff, stuff later. So I'll talk more about policies um, later, but that's, that's my take on what the status is right now in New York. Thank you so much and congratulations. It seems like a really great win, a great win um, for animals and a host of other really important causes. Um, this has been a really, really great kind of high level um, overview. And I'm thinking maybe we can move to what something Nancy touched on, which is kind of the cabinet picks and maybe some of the nitty gritty of particular administrative rules or pieces of legislation, which advocates should be, should be watching out for. Maybe Delcy, I'll pose that to you. Um, if there's particular cabinet picks that you're kind of watching, or if there's particular pieces of legislation or administrative rules that you're watching that you think other folks listening on the call maybe need to pay attention to. I'm gonna take that the second part of that question because I think there's actually one particular rule that we all need to be paying a lot of attention to because it has really significant implications for animals more than any other rule. And that is a midnight effort by the Trump administration to increase uh, the line speed limit for chicken slaughter to 175 birds per minute, which is a staggering rate. It's about three birds per second. And the Obama Biden US Department of Agriculture had already considered and rejected doing exactly this. And yet on the Friday after the election, Trump's USDA quietly submitted a proposed rule to the Office of Management and Budget, and we're expecting that to be published for comment any day now and for them to try to push it through. So I really encourage everybody on this um, call meeting um, to submit comments when that does happen. We need to do everything we can to oppose it. The impacts for animals, of course, are staggering. Already, the USDA acknowledges that under the current line speed limit of 140 birds per minute, birds routinely are being dropped into scalding tanks while they're still conscious and haven't been properly rendered unconscious, haven't been let out, uh, and they're dying from suffocation as a result. And that's only going to increase as line speeds increase, as well as uh, violent handling. The impacts on workers are also dire. Already these workers suffer some of the highest rates of injury of any in industry, as well as highest rates of COVID outbreaks and deaths. And that's only going to be worsened. Consumer uh, safety is also imperiled because of course, workers are less likely to be able to detect and prevent uh, contamination by antibiotic resistant, potentially fatal pathogens. And often overlooked are the environmental impacts. So it's really important to know that increasing line speeds means that more birds are going to be killed by the millions, certainly, possibly by the billions. And that is a significant animal welfare concern, of course, but also has significant environmental impacts at the slaughterhouse level, as well as at the level of the factory farms that are supplying the slaughterhouses. So this is basically a lose-lose for everybody except for the handful of multinational, multi-billion dollar corporations. And they are trying very hard to push it through. So this is something that my animal law litigation clinic at the Center for Animal Law Studies is hard at work at to oppose um, and prepared to challenge if it is pushed through the same way that we're currently challenging the Trump administration's deregulation of pig slaughter late last year. But it's something we need to watch very carefully and um, hopefully we can prevent it from happening, but that's not a guarantee. Um, we need to push hard for a Biden administration to overturn it if it is put in place. Um, and just zooming out a little bit, um, I wanted to sort of pick up on something I think Nancy was getting at before, which is our work is just starting now. I think we we know that, you know, it's a huge relief that we have a change in administration, but we need to remember that it's not like there was previously this great federal situation for animals. 
the feds have always failed animals and especially farmed animals. I mean, we don't have laws governing the treatment of farmed animals while they're being raised. Uh, the most significant federal statute for farmed animals, the Humane Slaughter Act, has been woefully under enforced, which I think Lewis is going to talk a little bit about. So we need to keep in mind that we have a lot of work ahead. Um, we're in a much better position than we might have been otherwise, but we still have a lot of work to do. And um, on the bipartisan point too, I think that's so important. Animal protection issues are absolutely bipartisan, not as much as they should be, but it's it's important to remember um, Eisenhower signed the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act into law and he was a Republican. It was a different Republican party, granted, but it's still, it's important to remember that history. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Chelsea. Yeah, I'm glad that yeah, you, you covered a lot of really important issues. I think that's those slaughter line speeds or something a lot of people on the call are really interested in watching. Maybe I'll open it next uh, to you, Lewis. I know you've been watching the election closely and uh, many folks on the call are probably eagerly uh, waiting for your, your next newsletter where you're gonna maybe share some of your thoughts on this, but I'm interested in your kind of high level takeaways on the election and also um, to Nancy and Delcy's points, any particular rules or bills or cabinet picks that, that you're interested in mentioning. Thanks, Becky. Um, and and I, I definitely agree with everything that's that's been said uh, so far. I think um, thinking about the US Department of Agriculture is, is probably the most important set of appointments. Um, some of you may be following the, the potential nominees. Heidi Heidkamp has, has been touted as, as the front runner, which would be a very bad pick for animals um, based on her voting record. Um, I know a number of groups are working on um, Masia Fudge, who is, is a uh, representative from Ohio who has a better record and would, would be much better in that role. Um, I think more broadly at USDA, there are a couple of, of really important appointments. Um, so they're really USDA's huge agency, third, third largest agency in the federal government, and it does lots of things that have nothing to do with animals. Um, it also lacks the statutory authority to actually do what matters most, which is regulate the conditions of, of animals on farm. Um, but there are three parts of the agency that I think are probably most important and correspond to different um, undersecretary picks. So the first one is, is the undersecretary for food safety. Uh, that oversees everything relating to slaughter. Uh, so both the, the line speed issues that, that Delcy was referring to, uh, but also the enforcement of the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, uh, which is currently only applied to mammals, most of you know probably. Uh, it, it would be a huge one if that was extended uh, to poultry. That would be a very... Uh, very hard uh, challenge to get, get that to, to happen. Um, even um, without that though, there is some minimal enforcement of, of humane conditions in, in poultry slaughter, slaughter currently under the uh, Poultry Products Inspection Act. And even just stepping that up um, within that part of USDA would be significant. Um, the, the second portion of USDA is uh, the responsibilities of the Undersecretary for Management, uh, for, for, for marketing rather, marketing and regulatory affairs. And this oversees the Agricultural Marketing Service, which um, is responsible for buying huge amounts of factory farmed meat. Um, and so it both does so regularly on behalf of, of other portions of the federal government um, and has basically no animal welfare standards. It, it, it nominally does have animal welfare standards, which is actually a nice kind of entry point in that they, they claim they're, they, uh, they should be standards, but they, they just deferred to what the industry standards are. Um, and it also presides over uh, one-off buybacks from industry. And so we've, we've seen this during COVID, we see it every time uh, anything even slightly unexpected happens, um, the USDA kind of runs in and says like, we'll buy hundreds of millions of dollars of, of factory farm chicken using, using taxpayer uh, funding with, with the express purpose, not of, of feeding people, but of, of helping out the industry that has too much chicken on its hand and doesn't want to take a, a cut on the, on the price. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of discretion within, within that part of the agency on, on how much it does to, to boost uh, factory farming. And then the third, um, the third portion is, is the Undersecretary for Research. And I think we sort of historically neglected this part of USDA, uh, but the, the federal government spends about $3.7 billion a year on agricultural research. Uh, it's a huge, huge amount of money. Um, a tiny sliver of that, about $30 million is nominally for animal welfare projects. Um, most of it uh, currently goes to industry priorities on, on animal welfare. And, and so seeing more animal welfare uh, friendly priorities there can make a big difference. But the other thing is, is seeing uh, more funding of alternative proteins. And, and so seeing more funding of, of plant-based protein, uh, cell-based protein research, I think could go a long way. 
Thank you so much for that, Lewis. I think that's a really great segue um, maybe to move to Scott, who really focuses on um, that kind of those plant-based and cell-based alternatives. So Scott, I'm really interested in your general takeaways uh, on the election and on also that particular question of what do you think um, this year means for those alternatives? Yeah, thanks, Becky. And, and thanks, Rocky, as well, for organizing this amazing panel and, and really great to listen to all the amazing panelists so far. Um, so just before I answer your question, Becky, I'll just give a little bit of quick context about GFI. So uh, for folks who don't know, the Good Food Institute is a global nonprofit uh, uh, that, that works to create a healthy, sustainable, and just food system. Um, and the primary way that we do that is to harness the power of markets and food innovation uh, to, to, sorry for that, my phone just dropped out of my pocket, um, for, um, uh, we, we harness the power of, of uh, markets and food innovation to, to accelerate the, the world's transition uh, towards alternative proteins. And so, you know, we're not an animal welfare organization, um, but of course, animal welfare is one of the motivations that might bring folks to work on alternative proteins in addition to, uh, you know, climate change and, and, and other motivations. Um, and kind of the two, the two main issues that we work on at the, the state level are opposing label censorship legislation. And then the second priority is kind of like what Lewis mentioned, uh, you know, working to uh, working with state legislatures to provide funding to research, open access research funding to accelerate the alternative protein industry. And so just to dive into each of those, you know, our first priority in terms of opposing label censorship, uh, some of y'all might've seen that there are a number of states that have unfortunately introduced uh, legislation that would criminalize the use of terms uh, such as veggie burger, plant-based sausage, soy milk, almond milk, uh, and even provide uh, jail time for, for, for companies that, that use those terms on their packaging. And of course, you know, we think this is ridiculous. Um, uh, legislators that introduce these bills have even explicitly claimed that those bills are intended or, or have been introduced with the intention of protecting the conventional animal agriculture industry. Um, and um, so, so it's clearly protectionism. And, um, you know, we, we work uh, in, in, in a wide variety of state legislatures over the last year, we've, we've been able to successfully defeat bills in states like uh, as diverse as, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, Washington, Maryland. So really, you know, getting to this theme of, of bipartisanship. Um, you know, I think it's, it, you know, some folks think that veggie burgers and alternative proteins are really just a coastal liberal elite thing, but that's clearly not the case. Um, you know, we, we, we've been really excited to work in a large number of states with partners, you know, on, on, on the right, including, you know, the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, Americans for Prosperity, um, include, in, as well as a, a wide variety of, of state-focused uh, conservative uh, think tanks. And so there really is, I think, bipartisan support for, for the work that we're doing. Um, uh, and, and, and that's something we've been really excited to see and, and, and been able to work with those partners to help defeat legislation in, 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 uh, in states, you know, across the pol political spectrum, like I mentioned. Um, and then, you know, the second, our second state priority, like I mentioned, is uh, generating open access research funding. Um, and, the, you know, an analogy that we, that I can make here is that states, as, as well as the federal government, really, have, have been pretty important to accelerating uh, the, the renewable energy industry. Um, and, you know, alternative protein, I think, is, is earlier in its growth than, than the renewable energy industry. But um, we think that states uh, like California, for example, and as well as a lot of others, could play a really important role in, in providing research funding, uh, primarily to go to universities uh, that could, that can really help accelerate um, uh, thinking in, in, in alternative protein. Um, and the reason that we think that open access research is so critical is that, you know, when a, when a private company does research, that's obviously really great, um, but that research can end up being duplicative because the knowledge isn't shared. Um, and so we think that there is tremendous value in, in, in providing open access funding specifically. Um, and so, you know, what, Becky, I'm, I promise I'm going to get your, to your question. So what are we expecting next year? You know, we, it, it, you know, at, at the state level, we actually saw a pretty remar remarkable amount of stability in terms of elections uh, in, uh, on, on November 3rd. So um, the only state legislature so far that has shifted hands is in New Hampshire, um, where the House and the Senate uh, shifted to, uh, to, to Republican control. Um, every single incumbent governor in the state in the country also uh, won their reelection. So it's a pretty remarkable amount of stability, actually. Um, uh, you know, even though, uh, you know, we, we are expecting that a lot of, well, across the country that, you know, COVID will inhibit uh, what state legislatures can do, and a lot of them probably won't meet in person. Um, uh, we have seen uh, some state legislatures try to continue passing label censorship bills. You know, the only two states this year that were able to, to sign label censorship bills into law this year were Oklahoma and, Oklahoma and Georgia, which, uh, you know, um, 
uh, thought that even in the, in the midst of a global pandemic that the scourge of veggie burgers was something that was important enough to address. So, um, so you know, we are expecting to see label censorship legislation. We've seen uh, label censorship bills filed, pre-filed and in, in, or one, one bill pre-filed so far in Texas that we we're gonna vigorously work to oppose and we were able to successfully defeat that label censorship bill in 2019. Um, so we're excited to, to fight that bill again. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll continue, I'm sure we'll continue to see other states introduce bills and we're, we'll work to oppose them where those come up. Um, and then we'll additionally continue to uh, advocate for research funding to help accelerate this sector. So really excited to get to the Q&A and thanks for the great question, Becky. Thank you so much for that, Scott. And I'm really glad that you and, and Lewis both touched on that kind of USDA um, research as something that's really, really important and perhaps has flown under the radar for kind of a lot of advocates. Um, so I'm interested in, for all the panelists now, where would you like to see advocates looking? Where are things that maybe you're concerned might fly under the radar? And that could be a cabinet pick, that could be a bill, that could be a state. Um, maybe I'll open that up uh, to, to Jabari to start, but all of the panelists feel free to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I'll start at the, uh, the state level. Um, I guess, you know, we uh, can look at, you know, concerns that are tied to, I guess, the uh, consistent uh, frustration over budgetary um, allocations and how things are being um, oriented and how, you know, you know, a, a decreased tax base might influence policy. So, for example, like in, in my um, platform, we said we would start putting a fund to help dairy um, farmers transition out of doing dairy into other other things. And the immediate answer is going to be for that is like, well, you know, if we have a smaller tax base, we can't really afford that. And that, you know, and a proposal for the status quo. So um, really fighting against like notions of austerity and saying that, you know, we actually can, you know, if we tax the rich um, fund, uh, you know, a move away from some of these uh, nasty practices. Um, and then there's also just, you know, every year we know there's going to be another farm bill passed, whether it's in your state um, or na nationwide, if it's, I, I saw some people are from like outside the state. So, you know, in your, in your country, even, you know, there is consistently, you know, you know, reevaluation of how we're funding um, farm bills and allocations. And that always flies under the radar, right? No one, no one ever pays attention to what, I mean, we do, right? But like not many people even focus on what's getting allocated money to in a, in a farm bill. So, you know, addressing that, um, I think is really, uh, you know, that's pretty potent as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the farm bill. Um, I'm really interested, uh, Delcy, Scott, um, Nancy, or Lewis, if there are any areas that you really would like to encourage um, advocates to kind of get engaged in or be watching, things that might you maybe are concerned might fly under the. Yeah, paper. yeah. I I see a question in the chat about how folks can actually help with some of these issues, and so I would point us towards sort of two things. Um, and the question is, how do we help get the right appointments in charge of these agencies? That's a, that's a sticky one. It's a difficult one. You'll notice that a lot of organizations are not specifically coming out for or against these different potential nominees. And there's a reason for that. Um, if they get placed into a position of leadership, uh, it's not uh, advantageous to our efforts to have come out against them in advance. So we can just look at their records and speculate about who would be better or worse. There are some specific efforts I've seen in favor of, for example, Marsha Fudge, who Lewis mentioned for, she's an Ohio representative right now, and she's also been the lead on the Safe Line Speed Act. So she's the author of a bill that would require USDA to slow down those line speeds, to not accelerate them to these extreme breakneck speeds the very thing Delcy was talking about. So she could potentially be put in charge of the agency she's asking to make this reform. That's very powerful. So there are some organizations um, and a whole panoply of interests are sort of aligning around her because of her progressive um, track record. Um, so some positive efforts like that can be had. As individuals, you can do outreach on this. You can create petitions in favor of certain individuals. I think we've only got a couple of weeks, if that, and some of these uh, announcements are going to come out. So I don't think there's much time to influence some of those races. Um, but I know all of us are having communications with various transition team members right now about these folks. Um, so uh, stay tuned on that. 
I think where you can really have an appreciable difference is where Delcy pointed us, and that is these regulatory efforts. They seem a little bit wonky and a little bit removed from actually helping animals, and they don't have some of the excitement of what Scott was talking about, where we're expanding opportunities for plant-based markets, which is a really exciting avenue. But if you think about it, there's an expanding pool of need out there for food and protein. And we want to make sure that we have access to markets for the plant-based proteins and, and don't lose those so that those products can grow. But that doesn't necessarily take away the harms of the animal agriculture. It's not necessarily a zero-sum game. It can all be an expansive game. And so one of the things that government has done, and especially the federal government, but possibly uh, I think we could point to some many state examples of this, but they've provided um, essentially privileges and opportunities that don't exist for other um, parts of the market share to animal agriculture. So they've, they've provided essentially welfare to these factory farmers, these big industrial farmers by enabling them to move their lines faster and make more money off every single animal. And that's an unfair advantage that's being provided by the government through these regulatory changes. They've also provided um, COVID relief uh, multiple times now to large industrial producers and including to producers who were awful enough to, because they couldn't handle the number of animals they'd produced. If you can imagine in this system, this incredibly fragile animal-based system we have, instead of being able to hold on to the animals that are healthy and, and maintain them while the market was upset because of the COVID crisis, they decided to move forward with killing millions of those healthy animals and through some of the most horrendous methods possible. Ventilation shutdown, where they literally deprive those animals of any kind of cooling and even oxygen. And in some cases, they apply heat to them. And this happened in the summer. It's still happening now. Millions of animals being boiled alive on the farms where they're raised, simply because these producers aren't set up to handle changes in the food system. And we know these changes are coming between climate change and other disasters that we can completely predict, these are serious disruptions that we can expect. And our food chain can't be that vulnerable that we're going to just horrendously kill millions of animals because they're stuck in the process. Those same producers that employed those methods received relief through the COVID packages. That's an area where we can make sure to engage, we can be active in speaking out, and here's another glimmer of hope around the new administration. We can at least hope that leadership like Biden and Harris care about these issues and provide more transparency. Right now, we don't even know where producers are using these horrendous depopulation methods. So there's a whole host of things that, that, that all of us can get involved with at the regulatory level. And I think all of our organizations would offer you various platforms for engaging I know that we have an advocacy brigade you can join and a variety of networks of volunteer opportunities, including very high level leadership through volunteer programs that are district captain based. And we need people from all over the country who can lead and galvanize support against or for these different measures. And there are things like this depopulation, the line speed we've already heard about, the organic label could be changed to implement humane standards for animals. And that could be done through the current authority of USDA. So we don't even need Congress to act on some of these items. We could just have a new administration make those changes. And again, if the leadership were good, we could actually see some positive changes. And they, again, they don't sound as direct as you'd like, but they could affect millions and millions of lives. So I think this is a really important area of advocacy. Thank you so much for that, Nancy. And I know we're getting close to our audience uh, Q&A portion, which I'm really excited for, but I would want to open it to the other panelists if they have any other kind of areas to watch or things we didn't touch on that you would like to bring up, maybe Delcy or um, Scott or Lewis. Yeah, I want to pick up on some things that Nancy mentioned. Um, the depopulation is hugely important, and there are a few petitions already pending before the USDA to require humane methods if it's going to be done and also to require transparency. So that's another really important opportunity. And thank you, Nancy, for mentioning um, 
Representative Fudge's sponsorship of the bill. I meant to do that and then neglected to do so. Um, notably, Senator Harris is also a co-sponsor of the companion bill in the Senate. Um, so that's positive. And I, I wanted to say, I know it can feel a little disheartening as animal advocates to be pushing for things as seemingly minor as humane slaughter or not cruelly quote, depopulating animals, and we want so much more. But I think it is so important to at least stave off this worsening of the situation for animals. Um, as Nancy mentioned, yes, we're seeing a surge in plant-based alternatives. We are also seeing more animals slaughtered than ever before. And that's not just because of exports to China. Per capita animal consumption in the US is continuing to rise. And so more animals are suffering as we deregulate in an increased way. So it is important to, to do these things. But another way that folks can get involved is at the local and state level. Nancy mentioned at the beginning, we tend to overemphasize the presidential election. And there's so much more to the situation. And I spent many years of my career working on captive wildlife issues, um, like circuses and roadside zoos. And we saw so much progress for those animals at the local level through local ordinances. Similarly, with the fur bans, the um, retail pet store bans. And I think there's a lot that can be done there. Um, it's not gonna be as easy for farmed animals, of course, nothing is, but I still think there's more that we could be looking at there and that can then percolate up to the state level and eventually it will make it easier to accomplish things at the federal level. And so any one of us could work on an ordinance in our local community. And that is something that is meaningful and might feel a little bit more direct to you. I, I still encourage you to be involved in the federal efforts, but I know it can feel a little bit remote. Thank I could just yeah oh yeah please go on yeah just just on the question of what can be done and and building up uh Delcy's point about finding some sort of uh cause for optimism I, I think um on slaughter although things are still in a very bad condition um it's sort of instructive to look at what's happened since the mid-2000s at the time um my sense is humane methods slaughter right basically wasn't being enforced at all and there was wasn't even an attempt to do anything regarding poultry slaughter uh, in 2005, USDA started um, doing some minimal policing of poultry slaughter, and uh, in 2008, massively stepped up enforcement of the Humane Methods and Slaughter Act. And both of those have continued, uh, both under the Obama administration and under the Trump administration. There's, there are new reports out from the Animal Welfare Institute uh, showing enforcement acts are at an all-time high. Um, the obviously still <laughs> major problems, but I think um, just looking at what seems to have have, have driven that. Um, one of the things that was explicitly cited by USDA were investigations. 2008 was, was the Hallmark Westland investigation in California, um, showed very inhumane conditions. Uh, in the mid-2000s, there have been a number of major investigations of poultry slaughterhouses. Um, they also cited pressure from Congress people who said they'd been hearing from their constituents about it. And so even if it's uh, not the number one thing that, that Congress people hear about, I think that stuff really can add up. Um, and the other factor that they, they've cited is, is pressure from, from companies, which of course is you know, a sad reflection that it takes the USDA to, to hear from companies that they want to see improved uh, enforcement, but that, that has made a difference. So I think one thing to, to sort of bear in mind is things like investigations really can have some of these flow through effects. Um, and, and so a lot of the things that I know people on school are doing on a day-to-day -day basis with their activism uh, really can, can help build up some of that, some of that pressure. Just one quick item to add. I know we've got a lot of really great questions in the chat, but um, so one thing that I'm uh, hoping and looking forward to seeing uh, next year is uh, that we will see uh, fiscal stimulus at the, at the state and federal level. And my hope is that some portion of this will include funding for open access research, fund, open access fund, uh, funding for alternative protein research. Um, and you know, we, we think that this kind of work is great because it can create jobs in a, in a sustainable in just industry. Um, it can make our food system safer and more secure. Um, uh, and it can help the United States continue to lead in food innovation. And so, um, you know, I, I'd be really excited to see that that happen both at the federal and state level. And if folks want to support that, you know, you can you can meet with your state representatives or state senators, uh, as well as your federal representatives and encourage them to uh, to look into this sector as, as something worth supporting. So I'm really hoping that we can see that next year. Thank you so much for that, Scott. Any um, final remarks that our panelists are kind of burning to mention before we move to the Q&A portion? 
All right. Well, then in that case, this has been great. I'm always really excited about the Q&A portion. Sometimes it's the, sometimes it's the best part. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague at Aquatic Life Institute, Rocky, uh, to moderate those questions. Thanks, Becky, and thank you all. Um, I'm loving this event, and I think we've got a really good uh, conversation going in the chat, if anyone hasn't checked that out yet, um, and a lot of great questions. So um, the first one, which comes to us from Zach, hi, Zach, um, is how can we better support policy for animals, um, for example, through volunteering or donating um, to lobby for better USDA appointments? Um, and Zach says that it seems like there aren't many great opportunities from what he can tell. Um, and with that, um, is there a reason for that, um, for kind of the, the lack of opportunities there? Um, is it relatively unimportant? And uh, Jacob chimed in and said, maybe it's just harder to move the needle. Um, so I think I will pass this one off initially to Jabari, and then if anyone else would like to chime in as well. So um, I'm going to plug a terrific advocacy organization in uh, New York State. Well, first, I'll just say, you know, um, in terms of volunteering, like, you know, you can search for ag advocacy groups that are always in need of money and always in need of um, volunteers. Uh, in New York State, we have an incredible organization, um, former board member called uh, VFAR, Voters for Animal Rights, which is, um, you know, we kind, we kind of co-wrote the animal rights platform on my, for my uh, race together. Um, and, you know, has done really good work lobbying um at the city level and you know also now coming into the, the state level for us we have progressive legislation for animals um so you know you can search for organizations like that in you know wherever you are i know you have people from all over the world on this call but um yeah looking for organizations that are doing the work of actually um focusing on legislation or targeting legislators um and you know, and, you know i know there's many fantastic groups that are looking uh, doing direct action which i also you know very important and it's also necessary um, but um, from the question I take it, this person is looking, you know, really there, there are groups of existing that um, focus on changing bills or drafting bills or getting certain things passed into law. Let me just say, I, I already mentioned, you know, our organization, the ASPCA has a series of different escalating levels of volunteer engagement that go from very minimal, you know, just sending alerts that we send out to being in charge of, of organizing in, in district meetings with your legislators and other important forums like that. Um, being involved at that level is really important because I think one of the things that happens is all of us get about 25 asks every day in our email to do things. And we can't do all those things. So getting involved with an organized network means that your energy is gonna get channeled towards an important goal that needs attention right at this moment. And it's gonna be amplified by everyone else doing the same thing at the same time. So I think that collective work is really important, but that's not enough. And each one of you are leaders in your own right. I, I'm looking out here and seeing colleagues I've known for 30 years in this, in this movement. And I'm also meeting new people who have just gotten involved. And I just wanna to emphasize to you, we are not enough to lead all these changes. Our organizations are doing our best, but we need you to step in and exert leadership, create your own structures. We as an organization at the ASPCA, we're a 501c3. We cannot get involved in candidate work and electioneering. Many organizations have C4 status and are in a PAC organization. So they are able to actually um, establish candidates and push them forward in through the election process. You can get involved in either side of that work. And it's really important to not, not wait for someone else to do it. Become the change that you want to see in this realm as well. And I think all of us feel like we would be happy to support that kind of development, to offer whatever information and expertise we can to it. But we're not going to be you know, the, the thing that makes the change. It's going to be everyone here jumping in and figuring out what do I have to give and how can I drive it forward? Just like Jabari did, like he just saw, here's an opportunity, here's a way I can express my values and I know how to do it in this way. So I, I know I'm kind of being a Pollyanna here, but I really believe in that. And I, I, I urge you not to wait for someone else to lead the way forward. Great, thank you. Um, any other panelists have any thoughts? Or um, if not, we can move on to the next question. 
Okay, great. Um, so this comes from John, and it's a question that definitely um, those of us at the Aquatic Life Institute are on board with. Um, he asks, have any of you started to think about opportunities related to fish in the new administration? Um, and he mentioned that it's reported that uh, Ron Klein is moving into the chief of staff role, and his wife, Monica, um, seems very passionate about the oceans in particular, and maybe animal advocacy more generally, has maybe um, worked to limit commercial fishing during the Obama administration. Um, so should we see that as a sign of hope? Um, and I'll lump onto this uh, a question from Jennifer, um, who mentions um, that the Trump executive order for offshore aquaculture is already underway. Um, and are there opportunities for the new administration to reverse this or um, in any way mitigate it? Um, so maybe I'll pass this off to Lewis initially, and then uh, if anyone has any thoughts. Sure. I, I, I don't have a, a ton of thoughts, honestly. Um, the, uh, you know, I think the, 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 the challenge on wild caught uh, fisheries more broadly is to prevent um, a, a reduction in fishing in one place, just leading to an increase in fishing in, in other places. Um, there's actually a new paper, uh, it was in maybe the, one of the prestigious journals anyway. <laughs> and I'll, I'll see if I can find it and put it in the, put it in the link, uh, arguing that, that if, if a couple of countries were just to restrict their fishing catch for a few years, it would significantly increase total global um, fishing catching. And the authors thought this was a good thing because from a sustainability perspective, it meant there were more fish and more fish could be caught. Um, but it does always worry me that, that you know, we, uh, it, it could be a little bit of a domino uh, or, or sorry, not a domino, a uh, um, humane version of whack-a-mole effect where uh, we, we uh, knock out um, fishing in, in US waters and, and just increase um, substantially fishing just outside of US waters. Um, but I, I don't want to be a complete downer on that. I'm sure there are people who are thinking um, about how there may be, uh, may, may be things we can do that could, that could you know, help, help change the global dynamic on this. Yeah, any thoughts from any of our other panelists on that? Um, or I guess maybe kind of more broadly, um, what it will look like for maybe negative Trump era policy um, in the years ahead as the Biden administration comes into full effect. I'll just jump in with a few brief comments. Um, first, thank you, John, for raising that question. I mean, so often we forget to talk about fish and we focus on land animals when we're talking about farmed animals. And of course, fish are by far the largest number and they suffer tremendously. And it's largely the Wild West in terms of the law for fish. And um, I wanna plug the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative at the Center for Animal Law Studies, which Becky was a fellow in previously. Um, so they're really focusing on these issues specifically and we're hoping with the Animal Law Litigation Clinic to work together with them to identify some opportunities because there's so much need here. Um, and I mean, perhaps one of the blessings in a weird way of the fact that the Trump administration governed so much through executive order is that that's going to be easier to overturn than if they had more formally gone through rulemaking. So I think those are sort of the lower hanging fruit and the things that we can and should expect the Biden administration to overturn. Great, any other thoughts on that one? We should expect it and I think we should demand it because one of the things that doesn't happen automatically is a lot of these horrible things that have taken place through the administration in the last four years just to overturn themselves. You know, this administration is gonna have, they're gonna be under siege. They've got a pandemic. They've got enormous economic issues to deal with. We're going to have to make our voices very loud to ensure that even some of these minimal and obvious things occur. Yeah, thank you all for that. Um, and one question that uh, William had posed is basically, um, do we think, I guess, in terms of animal welfare issues generally, or maybe in terms of specific ones, are there ones that we should really be focusing our energy at the federal level versus the state level or vice versa? Um, and I guess maybe I'll pose that to Scott and then um, maybe also Jabari as well. 
Yeah, so in terms of the trade-offs between, you know, the federal and state level, I'll keep my remarks limited to sort of alternative protein. I mean, I think uh, obviously the, the the federal government has a much larger fiscal capacity than state governments. Um, a lot of most state governments are pretty fiscally restricted in, in a wide number of uh, ways in, in, you know, ranging from how much tax, how, how much tax collection they can do compared to, uh, you know, whether they're permitted to, to, to run deficits annually. Um, and so um, I think, you know, when we when we think about how, how much aggregate funding can be provided to uh, to support the development of the alternative protein industry through open access research. Um, you know, the federal government is probably in the long run, the, the better opportunity for really creating massive change and being able to revolutionize, revolutionize our food system in, in this way. Um, that, that being said, you know, we've seen states lead on a lot of issues um, when, uh, when, when, when states you know, e even though states do have more limited fiscal capacity than the federal government, um, when states decide that, that an issue like uh, alternative protein or, you know, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, renewable energy is something that they want to invest in, that can clearly accelerate progress uh, for, for other states to do the same thing, for the federal government to do the same thing, for other countries even to consider doing the same thing. And so, um, so, so you know, we think that both, both opportunities are really promising. Um, um, yeah. Um. That was, that's awesome, Scott. Um, I'm also going to add on to, you know, one of my favorite things to do is to figure out what um, my opposition likes doing and, and do the opposite. So I know that that doesn't sound like an oversimplification, but I think it's helpful to, um, you know, think of, well, what do, uh, you know, industrial animal agriculture like lobbyists really want to keep fighting for, right? They want to keep pushing for as many ag gag laws as possible around the country, fight against that, right? Open up for transparency. They want to keep on fighting for um, intensive subsidies to animal agriculture. So we do the opposite, we fight against that, push it into plant-based, to alternative proteins, right? Or, or just plant-based um, meals. Um, in New York, we have a very powerful uh, dairy industry. New York is the third largest producer of dairy in the country, right? What do they want? They want what they're getting right now, which is um, increased subsidies for dairy farmers. You know, every once in a while, there's a sob story about another dairy farm being put out of business. They need more, they need more subsidies, right? Let's do the opposite, you know, what they'll be working for to transition them out of dairy. Um, and into into something else that's you know not you know hurting animals. So uh, that's I mean that's I, I know that might sound like oversimplification, but like you know if we have you know powerful opposition that's really fighting for something, it's a you know I know we often want to you know, fight on our own terms, but it's I think it's good to like address like what what they're trying to do and and fight against that too. Great, thank you. Any thoughts from any of our other panelists on that one? I think um, one thought we can take away, we've heard everyone express that this um, election cycle showed a lot of stability and actually favored a Republican slash GOP slash conservative bent a bit. And what Jabari just mentioned are these subsidies. And that really runs counter to the idea of a fair competitive marketplace. So I think we have some ways to frame these arguments that are about animal protection, about worker rights, about the environment, but also about what are those core values that this you know, new wave um, of legislators should be mindful of. And it, it's possible that they have taken a pass and decided not to care about those issues. We do have kind of a different Republican party now, but their constituencies should care. So highlighting this, going to town hall meetings, I know we are in a pandemic, so virtually going there, asking those questions, asking why is this industry getting a benefit that other industries aren't? These are things that everyone can do. And the more organic and the more genuine from grassroots um, standpoint and from constituents, really be mindful that as a constituent, your greatest power is with those who represent you. I think, I think those actions are really important. So thank you, Jafari. Great, very cool. Um, now uh, a question um, coming from Courtney saying, you know, we wish we could have a crystal ball, but I guess with your best guess, um, what policies do you think we might see from the new administration or what reversals of old policies do you think we can expect? Um, some thoughts with this, um, also, you know, kind of expanding it to human ag workers as well, um, maybe something related to the line speeds, maybe union support, um, maybe something reversing the order that meat packing is essential. Um, so I think probably a few of our panelists can speak to this. Maybe we can uh, kick it off with Delcy. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we absolutely need to get the line speeds issue um, reversed. Um, we need to stop the the increase in chicken line speed limits in its tracks. Um, and 
it is very possible that this administration is going to ram it through, in which case we're going to need to do more work to overturn it. I didn't talk a lot about the deregulation of pig slaughter, but in December of last year, a final rule went into effect that allows pigs to be slaughtered without any limits whatsoever on the speed, while also reducing inspector oversight. So it's, it's a recipe for disaster, and we're already seeing pig slaughterhouses that have transitioned to that system, and the USDA estimated that 93% of pigs killed in the U.S. will ultimately be slaughtered under this um, system of reduced oversight and higher speeds. So that's going to have to um, go through new rulemaking, and it's it's not going to be easy. It's not like you can just write an executive order and overturn it. So we need to do work to do that. We also need to stop industries push to to continue expanding to other industries. So in April. In the midst of the pandemic, the USDA granted the first ever line speed waiver to a cattle slaughterhouse. And so they're really trying to use this as a model to increase line speeds while reducing oversight across the board. And so we really need to prioritize doing that work and it's not gonna be just an easy signing and order type of thing. Great, any so, I'll just add, you know, one other thing that, um, the federal administration can do the new the new White House. They can they can make these reversals. They can reverse executive orders. They can they can change through the regulatory process. They can change those new regulations that have been put in place. They can also support legislation. They can't pass it because that's a different chamber, right? The, the, mem the only members of Congress can make law, but they can hear from the White House. Hey, the Farm System Reform Act that Senator Booker and Representative Khanna have authored that would phase out by 2040 large industrial CAFOs or, or uh, uh, factory farms. This, this kind of legislation that really sends a signal that requires country of origin labeling, that has a lot of other benefits in terms of leveling playing fields, that could be supported overtly by the administration and that might send a signal. Um, if the Senate were to flip, then that would lend um, some opportunity for advancing legislation like that. It's still very far reaching, but I think we need to see signals like that. Um, so we have a question from Monica. Um, hey, Tim, oh, I will very quickly mute. Bye, oh, mute. And just a friendly reminder to everybody to, uh, to please stay muted. Sorry guys, one moment here. Okay, great. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, so um, Monica mentions that Lewis has a great newsletter. Are there any other websites or resources that will specifically discuss um, the question that we're discussing here at the panel today? Um, and I guess maybe a question for all panelists, where do you get your news? Um, if you have any resources that you would recommend that folks check out. Um, so maybe we can start with Lewis for that one. Sure. Uh, yeah, there's, there's uh, I mean, honestly, Twitter um, <laughs> is probably, probably a, lot of, a lot of people here. Um, I think, uh, you know, both following um, activists who are really engaged on, on this um, is obviously one, one great way. Um, trying to stay up to speed on, on um, the journalists who, who do um, who cover ag news as well. So there, there are a couple of this, this um, someone at Politico, there are a couple of folks who, who do, and I think they have a lot of, um, a lot of the best coverage. Um, I, I don't know um, a perfect blog on this, but maybe someone else on this, on this panel uh, does. Yeah, I don't have a perfect recommendation either, Lewis, but I, I do second the Twitter recommendation. Twitter is both the best and the worst thing in my life at, at different points. Um, but I and th I don't think there is a recommendation that's maybe specific to alternative proteins. Uh, but I, I do think that the, the NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, is very useful. That's just a general resource uh, that, that tracks kind of all developments at the state level. Um, I, I really follow NCSL pretty closely. Um, I'm, I'd also recommend uh, Ballotpedia, which is kind of like Wikipedia for elections, maybe. I don't know if that's what they call themselves, but I think it's a actually pretty accurate term, uh, phrasing. Um, and um, uh, yeah, those, if you, you know, if, if you're that, those resources combined with kind of Twitter, and if you know what races you want to follow, um, you know, who, which, which folks you think are most important to really keep up with, I think that those resources can be really helpful. 
for federal resources, um, you can look at the Hill, Roll Call, Politico. Um, if you want to track bills, you can go to congress.gov and track any bill there, see who's co-sponsored. It's, it's all official there. Um, for state level, I think NCSL is an excellent idea. But most importantly, if you really care about making change, monitor the industry's publications. Monitor all the agriculture industry. They have so many different ways that they're speaking and they're telling what their strategies are. So keeping track of that is uh, very informative. Um, I'll also, also add, oh, sorry. oh, sorry, go ahead. Right, go ahead. Um, okay, I'll also add that if you are, if you do join an advocacy organization in your um, in your area or a national one, um, you know, if they are indeed lobbying and in advance legislation, they'll let you know, right? And they'll ask for your help in supporting it. Because a lot of these things do fly under the radar, um, especially legislation. And, you know, some would argue that that's by design. Um, so uh, yeah, if you're part of a group that's like really working for it, you'll be, you know, ideally part of the process of making sure that you're there at the right time to, you know, do the phone calls or the email writing, the letter writing or the ad direct action or whatever you can do to lobby your legislator or, or, or others. I love my Google alerts. They're great and you can tailor them to how you want. So I have, my husband makes one of me. I have one for pigs, <laughs> gets a lot of stuff. And then I have more tailored ones like for rectopamine. So whatever issue you're interested in, you can um, monitor it that way. And it's a great resource. Cool, thank you. And I know we just have um, five minutes left. Um, so I would put out, maybe we can just go through with all of the panelists um, and if everyone just has um, you know, one concluding remark, maybe um, something that you're hopeful for um, come maybe you know, May, 2021, um, something that you think we could see on the horizon. Um, I'll start and just say I'm so thankful that we have an incredible turnout today and a lot of great activists on the call. And I would just say if you're just getting started in this stuff, don't get caught up in like trying to find the perfect avenue into this um, or just, you know, you know, decision par par um, paralysis, like, you know, jump into, you know, something that, you know, seems reasonably good to you and get started there and you never know how these things snowball. So just get started. I'll say that I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, by next year we will see um, the federal government and numerous state governments uh, investing really significantly in alternative protein, uh, providing potentially even billions of dollars to help accelerate this industry. That would be very exciting to see. Um, and then uh, and keep in mind, this is my blue sky vision. You know, uh, I would also love to see label censorship, uh, you know, wiped out. We, we don't see any state governments or or, or, uh, or, or the, the federal government trying to censor the labels of alternative protein products. Um, that uh, they've recognized that, you know, we've been able to defeat those bills in, in such a large number of states and our litigation as well uh, has, has, you know, made them realize that these, these bills are ridiculous. And so that would be, those would be my two big hopes. Um, and just, yeah, really definitely want to second Jabari's remarks, really excited to see folks get engaged in this. Um, you know, if you're interested in meeting with your representatives to talk about uh, uh, alternative protein issues, definitely feel free to reach out to me. Um, and yeah, just really wonderful and, and, and looking forward to hearing everyone else's uh, closing remarks. Um, I can jump in and just say that in the policy realm, nothing is ever perfect. No law, no bill, no regulation, no proposal is perfect. You obviously don't want to support anything that's so imperfect that it doesn't advance the ball. But try to remember that you know, these, these things all need to be pushed. And we also don't want to waste so much time thinking about like what's the perfect vehicle to attack this issue because really what we're doing is we're building a muscle and we're demonstrating to the rest of the influencers and the political world that this is a credible cause, it's legitimate, it's real. We understand the system, we know how it works, we know how to pull levers. So sometimes just winning one of these battles that feels incredibly peripheral is really important for sending a signal that we're here, we're not going away, we're building our power and really demonstrating that this issue needs more attention. So find your way in, grab any one of these things that has been brought up and push hard. And, and when we have a success, that will help us get more successes. Uh, I, I definitely second Jabari on just get, getting involved. And, and I think uh, I think definitely folks um, often look for the perfect way in the space and it's really valuable to just to, 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 to get started. Um, two causes for sort of hope I would leave on. One is that um, it's mentioned earlier that Colin Peterson lost his 
seat in this election. I think this year we lost the two worst representatives on animals. Uh, Steve King lost his primary in July. Uh, and uh, although it doesn't mean we're gonna have legislation, it's, it's nice to see some of the worst people gone. Um, the, the second thing is the, the US DA agency review team, which I know was, was alluded to in the chat. There are a couple of good people on there. Um, as significantly, there's no one from agribusiness on that on that team. And I think that's the first uh, to, to have no one from agribusiness or the meat industry um, on that team. So a sign of, of, of slowly uh, changing times. I'll just say I'm I'm really hopeful right now. I've been an animal advocate for more than a quarter century now, which is a drop in the bucket compared to Nancy, but um, I am more hopeful now than I ever have been. I think there is more discussion about these issues. So yes, per capita animal consumption is, is continuing and we have a lot of work to do, but I'm amazed at the turnout today. I'm amazed at the discussions that are happening. I think COVID has shown a light on the interconnectedness of animal, human, and environmental interests. And I think we're talking um, across um, to coalitions and doing more coalition building and recognizing intersections more than ever. And that's how we're going to tackle these issues successfully. So um, keep doing what you're doing. You all can make a difference. And um, this is kind of a reminder to myself also, but remember to get out of your, your animal protection bubble because these issues absolutely are, are impacting other uh, populations as well. And there's a lot we can do together. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um, I just wanna say thank you again to all of our incredible panelists today. Um, this is definitely the biggest turnout we've had for any event yet. Um, and it's entirely a testament to just how awesome this full panel was. So um, yeah, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, and we just want to quickly plug, um, this event is part of a series. So um, for anyone who isn't aware, um, the wonderful Caitlin and Marianne earlier this year started the Effective Animal Advocacy Online Meetup. Um, and we are running with it now, um, trying to do kind of a series of panels and discussions. Um, and so we've got monthly events um, and then the aquatic animal specific EAAA event as well. Um, so you can uh, stay tuned for those each month. Um, and just a quick plug for some of the upcoming ones. Um, on Saturday the 21st, we're going to have a kind of year in review for the Aquatic um, Life Institute and the Aquatic Animal Alliance. So you can find out about some of the activity that's been happening around aquatic animal specific advocacy this year. Um, on Tuesday the 24th, we're going to have a panel discussion, how to decide where to give. Um, so that's a week before Giving Tuesday. Um, so if you're wondering how other people think about their donations or how you should think about your own, we're going to have a really great panel for that as well. Um, and then on December 12th, Faunalytics will be presenting on their 2020 research. Um, lots of really interesting stuff covering a variety of species um, and just tips for all of our advocacy. Um, so thank you all so much again for attending um, and hope to see you at future events. And thank you again to our panelists. Thank you all so much. Yeah, great event. And hopefully I'll see lots of you at the next one. Thanks to our panelists again. Thanks, and congratulations to Jabari, of course. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. It's great. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.